Hello, welcome to Shaka Extra Time. I am Paul Ndiho. Joining me is Vincent Makori, the host and managing editor of Africa 54, who is filling in for Shaka Sali. Hello, Vincent. Hello, Paul. Thank you. How are you? I am doing well. I hope you're doing fine too. Well, I'm hanging in there. Under the yeah. circumstances, I think uh, we've survived the year. It's a strange times, man. Yeah, we will remember these days. Yep. Let's uh, maybe right away start uh, with uh, the COVID uh, pandemic uh, from the perspective of how it started. It started off as a small thing uh, in Wuhan, China last December when everybody was talking about this outbreak that had uh, pneumonia-like symptoms. But uh, soon or later, we ha got to learn that this was one of the deadliest uh, diseases. And to this day, we are still trying to cope with the COVID-19. It has killed millions of people across the world yes you know when it started uh, way back when we started hearing this thing about wuhan in china uh, it sounded like something that is happening somewhere so far away right like all the way in china and you know in china we have associated it in the past with other pandemics uh in fact uh, there was the h1n1 there was the swine flu and all those things have kind of been associated with china and so when we heard about this most people thought it is something that will probably end somewhere there in china and uh it after some time it, there was evidence that it was starting to jump from china to other parts of the world including europe and eventually there was uh, there were cases reported in the united states but very critical initially because there was no case in africa most people started believing that there is it's not an africa type of virus that it will not infect africans in fact most people are so comfortable i remember talking to a friend of mine in senegal who said this is not an African thing, so we don't have to worry about anything. Uh, but then again, for those who are looking closely, uh, you know, there was the reality that, you know, if this thing was happening in China, China is very present in Africa. You know, everywhere you turn, everywhere you look, you're seeing Chinese because of their involvement uh, with the continent's uh, um, infrastructure development and economic, uh, uh, you know, initiatives. So uh, for those who are realistic, it was just going to be a matter of time. But people were initially very comfortable thinking, no, this is not going to touch us. And then sadly enough, of course, eventually we started hearing about cases in one country after another and uh you know you bring up a very good uh, point uh, initially a lot of uh, people were talking about how this is not an african thing uh, uh but maybe perhaps i should add that uh, many uh african countries have been praised for how they waged a, uh, a very effective campaign like right at the beginning of the year tried to make sure that they shut down some of their countries their borders and uh, to some extent uh, uh people who have a strong hold on power took advantage of that uh, literally it was you cannot be out there it was more like uh, the instituted curfews in almost all these other countries but maybe to uh, to a certain extent that helped to save a lot of lives yes you know uh, you have to give credit of course to the reaction uh, I, I think there was that fear the the fear that if this thing uh, you know strikes us in Africa, given our weak health infrastructure, given uh, you know the, the 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 nature of our 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 socio setup, uh, you know the poverty in some of these uh, crowded neighborhoods, it would decimate populations. So the political leadership was quick to take action, and they learned, of course, from countries that had dealt with other serious sicknesses, uh, you know, namely um, uh, Ebola in uh, west africa it wasn't many years ago when we had this serious serious um uh you know crisis in west africa where hundreds in fact thousands of people died and africans were concerned uh that if this was to be something similar to ebola and spread across the continent uh, you know we'll see probably millions die so that fear having witnessed what happened in other african countries i think helped uh you know the leadership to act quickly and, and also there was the, you know, 
the other thing that you know may look as a negative in the Western world, but it helped in this particular case whereby uh, some African countries are semi-authoritarian in uh, Africans had no say in what governments were doing. So when you're given an order, it is obeyed. If it's not obeyed, you face consequences. We had cases where, you know, police were actually out in force in some of the countries, you know, beating up people, forcing people to, you know, to adhere to the uh, uh, the precautions. And, and in some cases, even arresting people. So uh, they, you know, they spread fear in the society, in the communities to make sure people are obeying uh, these uh, rules that were set up. So while that is that can be seen as draconian, that can be seen as very, uh, you know, authoritarian, in terms of saving lives, it did help. And it, it has to some extent up to today, I think, can be credited to have helped save many, many lives across the continent. What do you make of the fact that uh, despite uh, what we've seen happen here in the Western world, especially here in the United States, uh, in Europe, uh, across the Americas, uh, things have been really, really bad uh, compared to Africa, uh, a population of over 1 billion people. But the numbers are still very, very low compared to what we see in the West. Yes. I, I think there are a number of things. One, I think the level of uh, uh, adherence to the uh, lockdown uh, rules that were put in place Africans uh, mostly did that without questioning. Even when they did, they couldn't uh, necessarily disobey governments. And so when you compare that to the Western world where the, you know, free, um, this sense of freedom and individual freedoms in some areas uh, made people feel that uh, they don't have to uh, obey these rules because it was undermining their businesses, it was undermining their freedoms. And in a number of cases we saw, especially in the United States, people ignoring uh, all those regulations that were being put in place and, and, and in fact, uh, you know, um, citing the, 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 the freedoms uh, that have been guaranteed by the Constitution and did not want to be dictated to by governments. So that was an undermining factor. Now, in Africa, so one of the things that helped, uh, besides having to, you know, being in fear of governments and regulation, is the fact that I'm not an expert, but when I observe the continent, I, 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 I get the sense that a number of Africans don't have as many underlying health issues that are very common in the West, which led to, you know, as we know, a great number of people who died initially are those who had certain underlying causes. You know, we have diabetes, uh, we have um, uh, TB, uh, we have, uh, you know, serious, uh, you know, what they call lifestyle uh, diseases in, in the West that are not as common in many African countries. In as much as, you know, we may have a few cases, especially with TB, where people had been uh, in, affected by HIV, like in Southern Africa, we had uh, quite a, you know, a scare uh, that it could kill as, as many people. Uh, but uh, across the continent, if you look, a great number of people may be poor, but they're generally healthy. You know, they're healthy, they eat healthy, they live a very uh, physical, active life. They don't have a sedentary lifestyle. And, and so they are actually... Uh, living free of some of the diseases, the underlying diseases that were the reasons for most of the deaths in the West. Because, come to think of it, this is the disease that didn't have a cure for anybody. You know, whether you lived in the US or in Europe, there was no known cure. So it's a disease that is almost, to a, to a large extent, dependent on your own uh, health condition and strength, an immune system. Uh, you know, in so many cases, uh, the stronger, the healthier you are, the more likely you are to survive it. So I think those are the two factors that to me uh, might have contributed to, uh, you know, to uh, reducing the number of infections and also the number of deaths on the continent. Earlier we talked about uh, how uh, uh, some leaders on the continent imposing curfews uh, lockdowns, uh, but uh, uh, most of these countries have since then relaxed those, uh, some of those uh, guidelines, uh, some of those uh, curfews. And uh, what we've seen, we've seen a surge uh, in uh, the number of cases, 
uh, the number of death. Uh, uh, when I talk to my parents uh, who are in a southwestern uh, uh, part of uh, uh, Uganda, a district called Lukonji, they tell me uh, they began to see a lot of uh, increases in death uh, of COVID-related uh, cases. Uh, people are dying, so which means once the government uh, relaxed some of these uh, measures, uh, people started, you know, going about their business and people are dying. You go to any hospital in, uh, in Uganda, in Kenya, people are dying of COVID. Hospitals are packed. The African governments did not have, um, a, 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 they did not have in place systems to cushion uh, the citizens against the impact of COVID-19, especially the economic impact. And then you have to realize uh, that when people have to choose between starving to death, feeding their children, or taking a risk, you know, with a virus out there, at some point they just have to take the chance because you're, you can't just sit at home and wait to die. Now, a great number of uh, our people on the continent are engaged in uh, informal sector employment. They are not employed by the government. They're self-employed or they work in small little concerns uh, where they only earn when they work. Now, governments put, up, put down these lockdowns, say people shouldn't go anywhere, but they didn't give people anything to live on. I, uh, you needed to pay rent. Some people uh, have to feed their children. They needed to take care of so many other issues. And there was nothing forthcoming from governments. We know that uh, there were funds that had been sent or rather given to some African countries to help, uh, you know, help people who are um, less affected seriously. And uh, what happened? Corruption took the better of most of these leaders. And we know that in a number of countries, millions of dollars was stolen by the political elite. We have millionaires who have come out of COVID-19. We have COVID-19 millionaires. Some are politicians or relatives of politicians or well-connected people to the system. So if this monies had actually been properly channeled to those who are seriously affected economically, give them some kind of uh, uh, economic relief. We've seen this happen in the US. This is the most powerful country in the world. Uh, but look, what is happening over those months the government was finding ways to try and cushion people against the impact of the economic uh, uh, devastation. Uh, you know, people have been given some some money. People have been given some relief. Some, you know, there were discussions on how to do we deal with this. What do we do with those people who work in hotel industries who couldn't continue serving because of the reality of the the moment? What was going to happen to the small businesses that relied on customers but who could not come in? And we've seen people fight to get some, uh, you know, government support. Now, if this can happen in a wealthy country, how about in the, uh, the less developed countries where people literally live from hand to mouth? People got to a point where they were desperate. They had to survive. So a great number of people, and I spoke to some, they said, what am I supposed to do? I have to go out there and do something. And what do, do they do? Go to marketplaces? which end up being crowded, and uh, some of these people uh, get, get to a point where even these PPOs are no, long, no longer available to them because, hey, you know, they don't have the means to, to get them. They were supposed to be distributed to, for free in some of these places. They don't get them. So that, I think, has become a reason why we saw this uh, surge in COVID infection cases and deaths. You just brought up a very good uh, point here. Uh, you talked about how even here in the Western world, we've seen how people are struggling. You see lines, miles and miles of, of people in their cars waiting to get a food donation. And uh, we live in a country where uh, most people have a little bit of cushion. You either have savings or you have a stable job that gives you an income. But a lot of people on the continent don't have that. So uh, there are people who have even argued that uh, there was even a more potent uh, virus, which is the hunger. And our governments were not prepared for that kind of stuff, even though uh, they instituted these uh, lockdowns, but they didn't think about how can they avoid that uh, 
hunger. People died of as a result of hunger. These were already vulnerable populations. I mean, these are people who, on a normal day, they only <laughs> they eat today, and they may not know where they'll get the next meal. And they have to go out and try to do something, whether they're selling some wares in the marketplace or they're trying to, you know, uh, to find a little day job. There are people who literally go to a factory, line up and work and get paid on that day for what they did on that day. And then you say, hey, we're going to have a lockdown for the next three months, four months, six months. This person is home. If you're selling umboga on the street. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not selling your burger. You're not selling your oranges or mangoes on the street. You're not selling your bananas. Eh? My talk is from my village. How do you expect this person to survive? They may be there for one week or two. After some point, they just give up and they give in. So uh, many people would say, yes, I know there's a virus out there. But what do I do? In fact, we had some of the people in this story say, what am I supposed to do? My children are looking at me and expecting something to eat. No government has come around to give me something. For me, it hit a home because my young brother was stuck in Ghana for six months. Uh, yeah. My sister, you met her, she lives in Nairobi. She was stuck yeah. in Uganda. Her family was in Kenya for about six months. Uh, I mean, it was really tough on my end. But uh, let's uh, maybe shift to another topic, elections. Uh, there were several elections. Uh, uh, there were some that uh, were more exciting than others. Uh, but uh, uh, or largely, uh, most of the elections that happened uh, during this uh, uh, period or the, during this year, 2020, uh, they were not surprising. In most cases, we have more of the same. Uh, there was no change. Uh, it, there was... I don't think most of them were even elections. In my view, they were more like selections. You look at a country like Tanzania. That wasn't an election where uh, the ruling party literally swept... The, there is not a single member of parliament uh, from the opposition in parliament. What kind of election is that? You know, looking across the continent, and uh, so many elections took place in the year 2020, uh, it was... Uh, rather disappointing because when you looked at a number of those elections you saw more of the same in some cases just worse than even in the past and uh, one would have expected that uh, you know after many years of uh, uh, you know holding elections and the continent striving to walk on the path of democracy and uh, smooth uh, you know uh, tr uh, election uh, that something would look a bit different but no now you give an example of Tanzania you know, Tanzania has been credited for being a peaceful country that has held elections uh, after every five years. We have seen a transfer uh, from one president to another. But what is very characteristic about Tanzania is that it has remained a country ruled by the same party since independence, Chama Chama Pindus, which is, used to be called Tanu before. And one would have uh, hoped that because the country, uh, rather the party, is confident enough, uh, given that it has the legacy of uh, Mwalimu Julius Nyerere, a great number of people still have that affinity to the party because of the history of it, uh, the connection with uh, Mwalimu Julius Nyerere, and, and, and you know, they, they, it has quite a following. But, of course, after uh, over some time, over some years now, the opposition in Tanzania has also grown strong. It has grown so strong that it has come close actually to winning the election. So it has been very sad to observe uh, the ruling party intimidate the opposition. In fact, in some, in some cases, literally make it impossible for the opposition to participate uh, through the muzzling of the free, uh, the media so that the opposition cannot uh, have their message go out freely uh, through uh, denying the, the opposition the freedoms to campaign. In fact, in some cases, arresting uh, the opposition politicians. So they created a very uneven playground for the elections that just happened last uh, in, the in the year 2020. And it was so sad because one thought it was totally unwarranted, given that, uh, you know, generally Tanzania, Tanzanians, a great number of Tanzanians, uh, I think have uh, 
strong support, give a lot of support to the Chama Chama Pinduze, they did not need to create that atmosphere of fear, uh, which led to what you've seen, a very lopsided result where the opposition is absent. And soon after the election, what did we see? In fact, the main uh, presidential candidate of the opposition, Tundulisu, had to flee the country and seek asylum elsewhere. Other uh, pol uh, political um, players also had to leave the country. Now, when a, when your leaders, when your uh, you know political leaders have to leave the country to go elsewhere in order to feel safe, one needs to reflect about where the country is. So Tanzania seemed to have not made as much progress democratically in as much as it holds the election, which again uh, helps us to appreciate that. Holding periodic elections does not equal to democracy. It does not equal, uh, you know, uh, development and progress in their political, um, you know, in, in, in terms of the political growth of a country. No. One could ask, uh, what's wrong with uh, East Africa? I mean, we've seen elections in Ghana. The elections in Ghana this time around were not perfect, but at least there were elections, at least the will of the people uh, counted, right? Uh, even though they've had issues, the opposition uh, refused uh, the election outcome. But chances are that they cannot overturn that election from talking to people. But we also saw uh, a cross in Ivory Coast, uh, in uh, Guinea Conakry, Alpha Conde, uh, in his 80s, wanting a third term. Uh, this guy... Uh, Alasan Watara in the Ivory Coast, changing the constitution to, to hang around for a third term. What's happening, really? What's going on with these leaders? Yes, it, it tells you a lot about, uh, personally, I've always said, you can't just put your trust in individuals, in politicians, because they're driven by the same spirit, uh, that of, um, you know, personal ambition. And uh, they... they given the opportunity, they will want to stay in power forever. And, and that is why you would be, you know, you, you observed in uh, Ivory Coast, for a person who came to power uh, the way he did, um, you know, Watara was a person that somebody thought would become the beacon of uh, hope for democracy in that region. And here he clamors, he manipulates the system to run for a third term and makes that weird argument people do that oh you know because we changed the constitution the other term does not really count uh you know that is a a very lame excuse to hang on <laughs> to power it doesn't matter how popular you are it doesn't matter how good you think you are what i think when you look at uh you know of and look at uh, water and look at so many other of uh, these other countries where those in power want to find a way to continue staying it's actually a disdain for the citizens. It is a, a show of uh, disrespect to the nation where an individual wants to tell you that he is the only person out of the millions of people who reside in that country that can run the country. Then what happens to his country? If he thought he's the only person who is good to run the country, what happens if he drops dead? The person who does not prepare for leadership for the next leader who does not prepare his country for uh, transition who does not allow other people in the country to ascend to positions of leadership and steer the country forward is a selfish self-centered person there's no other way why can't people take a cue from nelson mandela nelson mandela could have stayed in power at least for a second term who knows people could have even wanted him to stay for a third term or even he for life he had been in prison for 27 years. People spent their lives fighting for his release and just could not even dream of a day when he would become the president. When he became the president, it was surreal. It wasn't like they thought it's a dream. But Nelson Mandela said, one term is enough. Not because I'm not good enough to continue uh, ruling the country, but because there are other people in this country who can also uh, you know, take the reins of power because the country does not belong to me. When you're a president, you're just given a privilege. It's an honor to be the president. You do not own the country. 
Now, some have allowed it to go into their heads where they become the masters. They own the country. They do whatever they want. And they actually look at people and talk to them with so much disdain. I've had some leaders literally insult the, cit the, uh, the citizenry because I think in some way they look at people and say, you must be so stupid to allow me to continue ruling you for all this long couple of good uh, points are there vincent uh, how about uh, we go back to the point that uh, you made earlier uh the issue of uh, uh, amending uh, constitutions uh, what's wrong with uh, a country amending or changing its constitution after all a constitution is a working document uh, you can go in and change a few things every once in a while if you think things are not going the way you want uh, as long as you subject it to the people uh you it should be fine and we've seen all these leaders attempt to do that constitutions actually are supposed to be refined uh, especially when you look at the continent of africa a great number of constitutions were um were made by were created by the colonial masters uh, and therefore it behoves on the africans to write their own constitutions revise their constitutions uh, we've seen that in Kenya. There was a process where they literally tossed out the old constitution and wrote a brand new constitution. And right now they're working on how to even make it better. But here is the deal. Constitutions can be changed. Constitution can be amended, can be revised. But it's a question of what is the motive? What is the motive? If the motive is to make the constitution work better for the citizenry, and then it's okay. If the constitution is being designed to create institutions that will protect the citizens against the excesses of the politicians, then that is fine. If the constitution, however, is being revised, is being amended to allow a person to stay in power forever, wrong. Now, you could say that, well, countries like Germany uh, you know, the chancellor can stay on for as many years as possible. But one has to realize that under the cons that particular constitution, uh, these are parliamentary systems whereby the party that gets into power, uh, you know, can, can have their leader continue being the prime minister or the chancellor in the case of Germany. But these countries are very strong institutions that that particular leader cannot abuse power. You make a very good uh, distinction there, the example of uh, Germany. Uh, I could uh, maybe add, uh, uh, in the case of uh, Africa, South Africa is a parliamentary system. Uh, uh, Britain is a parliamentary system. The United States here is a presidential system. So maybe make that uh, distinction between a presidential system and a parliamentary system. So the presidential system, as it is here in the United States, is where the president and the, 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 uh, the, the vice president uh, are elected directly by the people and they have, they have been given the authority to run the government. There is the judiciary where there's the chief justice and the Supreme Court and then the rest of the judges across the country. And then there is the legislature, which is the Congress and Senate together. These bodies run as equals but each has a different role to play. When you go to a parliamentary system, uh, it's a system whereby the basically elect, uh, the citizens vote in a party, not an individual. They vote in a party. So, and then the leader of that party becomes the prime minister or the president in a parliamentary system. The beauty of this is that uh, if the president or the prime minister does not perform to the satisfaction of the country and people are not happy and they, they, they protest, they kind of feel dissatisfied, the party can recall the prime minister or the president. In other words, the party is boss. It can take away that position from that leader and then there will be a new election for a new prime minister or the new president for the party. Well, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Vincent. It's been a pleasure, Paul. Thank you very much.